gives me great pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers. My friend uh, Noah Wayne, a former student of mine, who is, as you can read from the programs, uh, the Director of Behavioral Health for Next Age. Uh, he's teaching on mindfulness and meditation and does research on the science of those. And you can pick up on his uh, TED Talk from, I think, 2014. So anyway, I'd like to introduce Noah Wayne, please. I forgot to say destination graduation, so. So I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up because I'm gonna need some crowd participation. Some of you may know this, and if you, if you do, great. I've tweaked it a little bit. So it's an honor and a privilege to, to be able to be up here and speak with you today uh, uh, on request by Greg. Um, I've known Greg since I started Kin 1000, which is perhaps a, a similar story to many of the people in this room um, back in 2001. And we've stayed in touch over the years. And as he mentioned, um, some of the classes that he's created, the Body is Light class, he asked me to, uh, to take over when, when he retired. So. When, when Greg asked me to speak, the idea behind the talk was our topic of uh, healing and happiness in a broken world. Um, my background and what I teach at York University and, and, and what I've become to uh, connect with Greg on, on many levels about is, is very much mindfulness meditation. But the, where this is going to start and where I was thinking about how to structure this, this talk I'm going to give to you was about a conversation that I had with a friend of mine over the last few years about how we would make the world a better place. And uh, one of the ideas that came about, and it wasn't my idea, so I'm not gonna take credit for it, it was his idea, and we had some great conversations about it, but that was the idea of creating a virus. We're gonna create a virus and infect the entire planet with the virus. But this was a very special virus. It wasn't, Melissa, uh, it wasn't evil in nature in any way, it was an empathy virus. The idea of somehow infecting the population across the world with something that would stimulate within their own minds the capacity for understanding the point of view of another human beings, their emotions, their lived situation, um, their fears, their happiness, their worries, and sending that around in, in a virus. And now well, we're not gonna do that uh, for a few reasons, one of which is ethically a little questionable, um, but you know, there are some logistical issues we couldn't figure out either. Um, but the idea is sound, the idea of how can one or, or groups of people leverage the concept of empathy and, and what are the widespread implications of that and how we treat other human beings and how we treat ourselves and our family and people that we don't know, the, name, the nameless and faceless other. Um, I, I do believe that empathy has the power to change the world. Uh, understanding the point of view and emotional state of other people has incredible um, power in how we treat each other. Um, it would have a significant impact on war, conflicts, how we allocate funding in our national budgets. Uh, but it's not just a projection of international relations. This has to begin on a personal experience. Each one of us on our day-to-day -day life has to be able to do what we can to cultivate the concept and the feeling of empathy and compassion. And this has to be done on a daily basis. Uh, I'm going to read you a quote from the Dalai Lama that he posted on Facebook on Friday. <laughs> because anger and hostility destroy our peace of mind it is they that are the real enemy. Anger ruins our health. A compassionate attitude restores it. If it were basic human nature to be angry, there would be no hope. 
but sim since it is our nature to be compassionate, there is. If the mind was always calm, it would always be full of love and compassion. And then we can spread that love and compassion to others. But if the mind is full of frustration and anger and guilt, then those are the things we end up spreading. So we don't have to use a virus to spread the concept of empathy and compassion. What we have to do and what we can do is work on the inner workings of our mind. And by embodying and living what it means to be empathetic and compassionate, is how we can then cultivate this across the world. And it begins with us. But how do you do that? How do you do that when, for lack of a better term, life is suffering? That people get diagnosed with horrible diseases, that people die, that people get injured, that people are hurt emotionally, physically, on a daily basis. If life is to suffer, how can we develop the empathy and compassion within oneself in order to be able to spread that to other people? And now I believe a part of the answer to that question is meditation. That meditation has a, a role to play in how we can make sense of a world which is very much defined by misery in many ways and make light of it and come out of it in a way that is productive and healthy and happy and so that you can spread this concept around. And now life is a, is a collection of hills and valleys. So we, we all experience this, we all have highs, we all have lows. Sometimes we're on a high and it's fantastic. And sometimes on, we're on a low and it's absolutely horrible. Um, sometimes you're on top of the world and sometimes it feels like the world is on top of you. Um, when you're at the valley, when you're on the bottom and you're experiencing a low, what is important to realize is that it won't always be like this, that things will change, that while you are at the bottom now, you will go up. And at one point you'll come back up to a peak. And when you do, it is important to realize that it is not always gonna be like this, that while you may be at a peak at a certain point in your life, you will then again go down and there will be more valleys to go through. And it's an appreciation that these things change, that life is an ebb and flow, is what makes us have the ability to weather this storm, to choose the middle path and to go through life in a way that is more control. And this is very much resilience. This is the definition of what resilience becomes. Uh, one of the turning points in my life happened just before I started my graduate school in 2007, before my first term of master's. I participated in a 10-day Vipassana course. Uh, Vipassana is taught by S.N. Goenka. Uh, it's a 10-day silent retreat where from about 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning until about 9 o'clock at night, they teach you meditation. Um, you partake in noble silence for 10 days, uh, eating only vegetarian meals and nothing after, after midday. Um, and for me, this, this experience, these 10 days, which kind of kick-started my graduate career, uh, was an awakening experience. And I don't mean awakening by enlightenment, far from it. Um, this was more about the sense and the idea that I was able to learn about a state of control of my own internal experience and my own attention, that I could have control over my attention and that I was very much until this point, not in control. That that ability to choose where I wanted to divert my attention to was something that I had to practice at in order to get, become good at. Um, so while I was practicing in the course, I, my background in kinesiology at York, I did kinesiology and health science and a double major in psychology. And what blew my mind while I was practicing was that while I was sitting on the floor doing nothing, I was able to place names and explanations on physiological and psychological phenomena that were happening within my body um, that I had only read about in textbooks. And it, it brought me to sitting on the floor with my eyes closed to actually experience those things. And so if you have ever practiced breath awareness or anapana meditation as a meditation, you understand how difficult it is. It's a simple task, a simple form of meditation, but it's not an easy task. If I asked everybody in this room to close your eyes, I'm not going to just for the sake of time, but if I asked you to, to close your eyes and pay attention to your breath for five minutes, not to control your breath, not to try to breathe deep or abdominal breathing, but simply to be aware of your breath as it occurs in its natural state for five minutes. Most people, if nobody, maybe, 
but chances are nobody would be able to do it. And it's not because you didn't necessarily want to give the effort to do it, but that that level of attentional control is actually a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, at least once, at least once, your mind would wander from whatever, from that, that task. Um, and the thought, a thought may pop into your mind, a thought about what you're doing later today or tomorrow, or a thought about what you did yesterday, or the pain that you're having in your knee, or that person that cut you off on your way here, or the pain in your back, or the sounds around the room, any number of things could distract you. But that brings us back to the point, or brings us back to your breath. And despite your effort to pay attention to your breath, your mind is very easily distractible. And it is true for all of us. Your attention is easily hijacked. And I, I personally believe this is more of an issue today because of these things, um, because of our tweeting and our liking and our posts. And out of curiosity, who, how many people here, rays of cell phones, have a cell phone in their hand right now? Oh, yeah, that's great. For those that raised, thank you very much for being honest. <laughs> um, th so that process, and so I'm not going to go into too much of uh, two, 3,000 years of Buddhist philosophy or meditation uh, science in this next 10 minutes. Um, but just as a brief overview, when your mind wanders, when you're given an intentional task, there's a very specific area of your brain that's involved in that process, uh, referred to as the default mode network. It's this part of the brain that gets activated when we are task negative. So we're not necessarily doing anything. We're daydreaming, we're ruminating, we're just staring out the windows at the clouds. It's this default mode network that's in play versus the other side, the active, the task focused network. And so if anybody drives, I love using this example, if anybody drives and you're sitting at a, green, at a red light in your car and just daydreaming, mine's flying away, all of a sudden, the next thing you realize is you're 200 meters down the road and you do not remember the light turning green. But it must have because there's other cars around you as well. And so unless you all just ran the red light, you, you didn't, you didn't, um, you actually, the light actually turned green. Just that momentary blip of awareness at that specific point of time was your default mode network kicking on and your active attention reducing down and you were just kind of on, on autopilot. Um, the reason why I found that this level of attentional control was so interesting and important to our lived experience was because when you are able to control your attention at will, there is, a, there is a direct relationship to your emotional state and your happiness. And that there have been studies now that have looked using different methods like experiential sampling method of just bu buzzing people on a cell phone saying, hey, what are you doing? And what are you thinking about? And how happy are you? And they find that people who are paying attention to what they're doing at a given moment are happier versus those who are thinking about something that is not what they're immediately doing. And when it comes to issues of depression and anxiety, from a certain point of view, these, um, these mood conditions, these mood disorders are disorders of attention. They are of getting stuck on a repetitive thought process that is uncomfortable and unpleasant and unhealthy. And I'm not trying to say that we would avoid unpleasant thoughts, but it's about having a positive relationship with those thoughts. And being able to control our attention and accept the, um, when the thoughts come in and letting them go and then being able to move your attention back to something that has more productivity. Controlling your mind allows us to control what the focus of our attention is. And in mindfulness practice, we typically use the breath as an anchor to bring ourselves back into the current moment and pay attention, to, pay attention to this current moment in time. So when your mind wanders, you bring it back. Layered on top of this attentional practice is this concept of non-reactivity and non-judgment. To observe but not judge. That we personally, with intention, focus our intention on the moment and regardless of what it brings, regardless of what thoughts pop into our mind, the situations around those thoughts, the people involved in those thoughts, that we do not react. We do not, do not react with anger or hatred. Um, that we observe simply that this is the thought that's popped into my mind and it's okay. And we let that thought go and we bring our attention back to our breath. Uh, instead of getting angry and frustrated, we simply observe the reality of the moment. This is the thought and my, that my mind has wandered to at this moment in time. 
If we don't, we can very easily get into this repetitive motion of thinking over and over and over on that same thought, getting angrier and more frustrated over and over again. And this practice, this, this active process of paying attention to the breath, allowing the mind to wander, when the mind wanders, accepting the mind has wandered, bringing the, bringing the attention back without judging the thought allows us to weather that storm. That's actual experiential education in practice teaching us how to manage the ups and downs of our reality, of our everyday. Um, and it teaches you this a huge concept in mindfulness called uh, aversion and craving. And so aversion and craving, the root of all misery, uh, uh, according to Buddhist philosophy, can be summed up in this way. I like this. I want more of this. I don't get it. Misery. I don't like this. I get it. Misery. And so while you're constantly in this battle of, I want more of this, but I don't get it, or I'm craving this, I'm averted to this, you're constantly jumping back and forth into these states of being upset with the current reality of your, of your experience. And so just to understand and take this outside for a second, so to be able to view when not just about what's going on while you're practicing meditation, but also in the ebbs and flows of your life. I'm in a valley right now. I objectively observe that this is a state of being for me that is uh, uncomfortable and I'd like to move out of it. And then as well, switching to the other side. Um, and so, because I only have two minutes and about five minutes left to go, I'm gonna jump through very quickly. The connection that we have to make now is how did the control of attention and the control of your judgments and non-reaction connect to compassion and empathy. And this, has to, this begins with oneself, that when you in, exert attentional control and non-reaction, you invariably lead to self-reflection of what's going on into the inter internal experience of your reality. And it's through that that you realize that your thoughts do not define you, and that these are just thoughts fleeting, that they pass, and that it gives you the space to be able to provide the empathy and compassion to oneself um, and forgive yourself for past transgressions, for things that you may have feeling guilty for, et cetera, and allow you to move forward in your day with, with confidence, with clarity, and with resolve. But that, that act of self-reflection is a skill. It's something that we have to practice. Um, and if you pr choose to practice mindfulness or some other form of meditation, don't lose track of the, of the aspect that a huge component of the teachings, original teachings of, mind, of meditation is of the incorporation of love and compassion into the practice. It's uh, in, on, in Western culture where we, we have very much stripped the cultural and the religious connotations around mindfulness to make it more accessible. And in many ways it was the right thing to do, but we have to just be careful that we don't lose sight of the empathy and compassion because that's an important part of it. And that's also universal. Um, we must self-reflect in order to have self-compassion, and self-compassion is necessary so we can spread compassion to others. And the world needs more of it, and this is all bundled up in the practice of meditation. And the idea behind this is that regardless of what you're confronted with any day of the, any day of the week, any day of your life, that the default position that we take stems from love and compassion, not from anywhere else, but regardless of the interaction, you always start that perception from a place of love and compassion and empathy. And I can prove to you this works. I can actually prove it. In my life, when I've interacted with people across the gamut, the one person that I know of in my life that embodies this is that man right over there. And if you know him, if you've had the privilege of interacting with Greg, then you know that every interaction, he comes to it from a pace of love and empathy and compassion. It makes you feel like you are the most important person in the world. So I really wanna thank you, Greg, for the opportunity to be up here and, and speak my, my truth in this, this, this little talk. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, 
a dear friend of mine for the past 20 years and uh, a person I hold in the highest esteem, Dr. Emily Chen Ko, who is a health consultant in traditional Chinese medicines, in uh, Chinese herbs and essential oils to help the flow and balance out your energies. Um, she has been a lecturer at uh, CMCC, the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College, the College of Naturopathy. And I was so fortunate to have met her in 1999 and invite her to come up to York to demonstrate acupuncture and also to lecture to the students about the, the deeper roots and traditions of traditional Chinese medicine, which she had studied for 12 years before entering into the practice. And uh, she's got a sublime personality, but get this folks, her first granddaughter was supposed to be born tomorrow on election day, but actually was born a couple days ago. So she's now a new grandmother of baby Georgia. So I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. Emily Chenko. Please give her a call. I'm really happy and pleased to be here today. I met Professor Greg over 20 years ago at a Blue West Village Festival. I was actually doing a Tai Chi demonstration with Master Helen Wu and introduced them. And following that, Professor Greg joined our class and eventually it led to him asking me if I would be a guest speaker in his class in kinesiology at York U. And um, I was very happy to be there to introduce traditional Chinese medicine to his class. And as Professor Greg started his class, you're not gonna get away with this, Greg, you know, he wrote in large caps on the board, destination graduation. Do you know, I wasn't a student, I was there to give a little lecture. But those words, the phrase, just stuck in my head. I thought to myself then and still now, what a unique way of getting everyone's attention. So much so that many, many moons later, as our friendship grew, I have not forgotten that phrase. For me, it is as if Professor Greg has planted a phrase that helps me to focus on achievement and accomplishment. Even though I was not in his class, if I had a professor, like him, I would probably be a student forever. I've been fortunate to have experienced numerous conversations with Professor Greg over coffee through the years. An exceptional person, conversations with him leaves you inspired. His profound words linger in your mind and as you stand back, you realize that he has left you thoughtful, encouraged, uplifted and motivated. I think some of you who know him will share those same thoughts. Thank you, Greg, for being in my life. Throughout his difficult journey in the past year, he has kept a remarkable positive attitude. And as a health consultant, being, being, having been in practice for over 30 years, I cannot begin to explain to you how important that attitude is in health and healing. Chinese medicine, which is what I'm a little bit more, uh, more my area. So when I talk about organs and things like that, it is from the traditional Chinese medicine point of view. Chinese medicine treats a person not just at the physical level, but also the mental, emo emotional, and spiritual aspects. The focus of health and happiness in a broken world, a very important one is a very important point. It has been said that for every minute you are angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. I'd like to add to that because I found this, um, and I love quotes and sayings, so you're gonna hear a lot of quotes and sayings. So this quote says, one minute of anger weakens the immune system for up to four to five hours. One minute of laughter boosts the immune system for 24 hours. I think we should all laugh, right? In Chinese medicine, the heart is the emperor organ or considered the emperor organ. It recognizes the various emotions that each organ is related to. Happiness, 
is an emotion associated with the heart. All emotions in Chinese medicine, and we actually call it the seven passions, um, affect not only the organ itself, but it will always affect the heart. Example, the emotion of anger relates to the liver, but it is the heart that recognizes this emotion and makes you feel the anger. The seven passions or emotions are considered a major cause of illness according to traditional Chinese medicine. And there is also another saying in traditional Chinese medicine, the heart houses the mind, which includes emotions and your spirit. It is the center of perception and self-awareness. It is the residence of the Shen, which can be translated as the mind. When we think of the heart, the emperor, remember that health and happiness can be achieved by our awareness of our thoughts that have an effect on the mind and the brain and that they affect every single cell in our body. So if we practice awareness of our thoughts, we will realize the effects of anything that is negative or positive in our thinking. I have a love for quotes, as I said, and I have another one. The happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. Every cell in your body is eavesdropping on your thoughts every day. And this one is my favorite. I probably came across it many, many years ago and have used it very often to talk to friends, people who are stressed out, or even patients. That the birds of worry and care fly over your head. This you cannot change. But that they build nests in your hair. This you can prevent. And it is a Chinese proverb. It's one of my favorites. Now, having been in clinical practice for over 30 years, I share with you my view of how to try to stay healthy at a preventive level. There are two crucial things to keep in mind to help the body, apart from planting positive thoughts in our minds and to make ourselves happy. One is the immune system. The second is inflammation. If we support these two areas as best we can, we may be able to prevent progression of existing illness and or to prevent further degeneration and allow the body to fight whatever comes our way as almost all serious health issues and conditions is dependent on a strong immune system. So apart from learning how to achieve happiness there are concepts in, t in traditional Chinese medicine that also explain what is important to support. Chinese medicine refers to two very important components in the body. One called qi, which is energy, and blood. And I like to use this analogy. Again, it's about traffic. So imagine qi and blood, the two most important components to think about from the Chinese medicine point of view. Imagine them to be like cars on a highway trying to get to its destination. However, sometimes the cars slow down and there is congestion. Traffic slows down and if left unaddressed, that congestion will certainly lead to a traffic jam. Here is where I would like to say Western medicine treats you at traffic jams. Chinese medicine has the ability to treat before the congestion leads to a traffic jam. This enables us to treat the body at a preventive level. The thought here is free flow. Free flow of qi and blood moving smoothly throughout the whole body to achieve optimal health like the cars on the highway getting to their destination. Another example to understand Chinese medicine is to visualize a tree standing tall with roots. We may have complaints regarding the color of the leaves 
or if they look dry, not bearing as many fruits and flowers. The art of taking health history from Chinese medicine point of view enables one to think much further, to focus on the treatment of what we call root cause. It could be as simple as watering or nourishing the root and all the leaves, flowers, and fruit will take care of itself. I like to quote Churchill here. He says, the further backward you can look, the further forward you're likely to see. Knowledge of one's constitutional health and past health history allows Chinese medicine to help in strengthening the root, which can help prevent the occurrence of health issues. Western medicine might decide to address the disease branch by removing it, while Chinese medicine tracing root cause of illness may decide that nourishing the root can solve the health concerns. And we use herbs and different supplements to help nourish the root apart from use, utilizing acupuncture. One thing to remember, we are not drug deficient, but we could be deficient in kidney chi, deficient in lung chi or heart chi, but we are not drug deficient. But if you seek help from Western medicine, they have no way of treating that except for drugs. And I heard a speaker once during listening to a podcast, and he said this, we are not drug deficient. To follow the concepts of thoughts and thinking to achieve happiness and health, another interesting concept is based on Dr. Masara Emoto's book, Hidden Messages in Water. We talked about that at our last coffee, yes. We believe that water has a memory. Who believes water has a memory? Do we all believe that? Yeah, because you, you need to probably bring it a step further. We are about 65% water. And babies and infants, since I'm a new grandmother, when I read this with great interest, infants, 75 to 78% of, of their bodies hold water. By holding the intention of peace towards water, by thinking, speaking, and acting with the intention of peace towards water, can and will bring peace to our bodies, to the world. This is actually a phrase by Dr. Emoto. A powerful microscope is used in a very cold room with high-speed photography, and this is used to take pictures of newly formed crystals of water samples. These crystals change when specific concentrated thoughts are directed towards them. Positive thoughts can result in colorful snowflake patterns. And negative thoughts can result in incomplete asymmetrical patterns with dull colors. Molecules of water are affected by our thoughts, words, and feelings, even if not spoken verbally. If you just even write a letter, you know, and stick it in a glass of water, and it will affect the water in different ways. If you write another letter, maybe a swear word of some sort, <laughs> and stick it on the glass of water, you'll see what happens to the water to that water. The implications of this research creates new awareness of how we can positively impact our health and environment. And so another favorite saying I like and use all the time is our tissue, our issues are in our tissues. They are, they will get there depending on your thought pattern. And I'd like to share some final quotes with you so, an old healer to the soul is not your back that hurts but the burden. It's not your eyes that hurt but injustice. It's not your head that hurts, it's your thoughts, not the throat, but what you don't express or say with anger. Not the stomach hurts, but what the soul does not digest. It's not the liver that hurts, it's the anger. It's not your heart that hurts, but love. 
and it is love itself that contains the most powerful medicine. The author of this is actually unknown. <laughs> Once you become consciously aware of just how powerful your thoughts are, you will realize everything in your life is exactly how you allow it to be, not anyone else. Happiness is the new rich, inner peace is the new success, health is the new wealth, and kindness is the new cool. Health does not always come from medicine. Most of the time, it comes from peace of mind, peace in heart, peace in the soul. It comes from laughter and love. Professor Greg, I send you my love and gratitude for being in my life. May your spirit be nourished continuously by all that surround you. And to your wonderful children for organizing this event. And thank you for allowing me to speak today and for lending me your ears. My hope for all is to keep well. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, my next friend and presenter who is a distinguished gentleman uh, Stephen Moore is an artist. He's an author. He wrote T-Ball and the World Spinners. He's got a, another uh, book coming out at the end of this month. It's the uh, Christmas Adventure. Uh, as I said, he's an artist. He's a Reiki practitioner and reflexology master. But uh, I met him because he was teaching a Wu-style Tai Chi, and I was lucky enough to be in his uh, class which at the 4th Street Senior Center in South Etobicoke is so small, it almost feels like a private lesson. And uh, that's really a treat. Now, I've been studying Tai Chi for about 25 years after other martial arts experiences, and I find it endlessly fascinating and endlessly challenging. Although, as I've had to tell Stephen, I never have trouble uh, coming into class with the beginner's mind because I can never remember what happened in the last class. <laughs> so I'd like you to give a warm welcome to my friend Stephen Moore, who's going to introduce you to some Qigong and uh, possibly demonstrate his form. But one other thing I have to tell you, there is a, a specific form of dancing in the middle part of England that's not very well known here. It's called Northern Soul. And he gave a sublime demonstration of it once after a Tai Chi class, and I think I must have laughed for an entire week after that. So please give a give a warm welcome to Stephen Moore. You're gonna take this one. Yeah, you can have the wireless. Thank you, George. Good afternoon, everybody. I feel very humble to be here today in the presence of such great speakers. I've not known Greg for so many uh, months, even, but I've come to know him, and I like to call him my friend, which is. And it, what he just said just now was very uh, heartfelt. I've been teaching uh, Tai Chi since 1990. Uh, prior to that, I did karate, I did Aikido. Um, tai Chi is the ultimate for me, okay? It is the ultimate. It is not like most conventional martial arts, which are done in a straightforward linear fashion. Tai Chi is done in circles, spirals, and arcs. Uh, but as I don't have too much time, I suggest that everybody could just stand up and we'll begin. Rule number one, never stand with your arm folded. <laughs> <laughs> of course people say it's a mental barrier, but the reality is, if you think about it, this is weight, okay, this is weight. So eventually what happens is fine, it's the curve. Pressure gets pushed down into the internal organs. You need to relax more, relax. It's all about relaxation, but, okay? So if we try this, some people try this, just relax. But just okay. relax and just find control of your memory. Okay? Here, and that's in the So if you want to move some time. And that's purely and simply, but you just turn my waist. Turn my waist. Here, here. Lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it. All this, this, and that. And falls. Rises and falls. Good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> nice and light. Nice. 
this is great for meditation. If you actually study out in, out in the field doing this, you really get like connected this with nature. But just have that feeling that is this hand going to go down and put right down to my heel, down this energy center, energy line that goes down here, right down into my heel. And I rise and fall. Rise and fall. And this is something you can take away from this particular uh, demonstration. Simple, easy, effective. Nice and light. Try and get your shoulders down. Try not to do this. It's not far away. No, no, we're good. Up and down. Down and down. Rises and falls. Rises and falls. Slow. The body needs to slow down. What happens today in Western society is that we forget to talk to our bodies. In the olden days, when we didn't have as many mental distractions, we could achieve that. And that's just a demonstration of the first third of the 44 movements. So uh, I guess you don't know that you're going to be tested on that right after this is over. So uh, you don't have to have your pencils and pens. You have to give a live demonstration in front of everybody. Uh, no, thank you so much for that, Stephen. It was wonderful. And uh, what a beautiful art it is. I encourage everybody to find some form of moving meditation that allows you to step out of your life and be yourself without having to be anything for anybody else. And that's one of the things that's really important about self-care is, uh, you know what they say, the flight attendants will always say this before the flight takes off. Um, if the oxygen mask come down out of the ceiling, make sure that you affix your own oxygen mask before attempting to render assistance to someone else because you'll be a liability for them if you don't have the oxygen to preserve yourself. And it's probably good advice for living your life, making sure that you are taking care of yourself as a measure of your ability to care for other people. Um, a lot of us are predisposed to be great givers, but you can give it all away and then find that you're coming last in your own life. And so uh, that was a great demonstration. I'm glad you all participated in it. And what a thrill to see the people that I care about moving in something that I love so passionately. And uh, um, although following on, on what Emily said, I don't know, what if, what, I'm going to have to reflect on, on what's happened here today because I'm so uplifted by the gift of your presence that I feel energized. I feel like I'm going to live forever. But in terms of my diagnosis, um, now is forever. <laughs> so I treasure it. I really don't have the words to express how to introduce our next presenter, uh, friend, teacher, mentor, partner, teammate, uh, entrepreneur, uh, brilliant guy, my friend UJ Ramdas, who uh, was the president of the meditation club at York. And uh, one of my students, Darcy Gill, asked if 
if he could come into the class I was teaching body at, this, at light. And when I met UJ, I was so impressed he audited the whole class, which to me was a very unusual dedication because you get no credit for it. But I learned so much from him. And in our time afterwards, I, uh, I found that that, that uh, teacher-student relationship became, as it so often does, and it has for so many of you who are here today, it became a true friendship a lifelong friendship and a very rewarding one. And like all relationships that are worthwhile, it has to be mutual and reciprocal. I mean, I heard once that if two people always agree, only one person's doing the thinking. So <laughs> I find it's, it's really wonderful when you can switch roles. And, uh, and, and, and UJ can tell you that, uh, as I've said many times in almost all my classes, seek out those people who are mentors for you, but recognize there's a difference between a mentor and a tormentor. <laughs> so you wanna make sure you get the right kind. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, the uh, co-founder of the Five Minute Journal, co-founder of Intelligent Change. Um, uh, he has so many accomplishments that I'd use up the rest of the time to try to detail them, but I'd like to introduce him ask you to give a warm welcome to UJ Ramdas. <laughs> My name is UJ Ramdas, and I've had a pleasure and honor of knowing Greg for over 10 years now. First, as a student, and then as a friend, a brother, a companion on the path. In my life, I've given dozens of speeches, and nearly all of them without props or notes. But when I was preparing for the speech, I realized there was no way I was going to be able to give the speech without some aid. This is a deeply personal speech because Greg has changed my life as he has for tens of thousands of others. But today, we celebrate this wild and wonderful man, Greg Milzeki. And I want to share with you three stories of how he's impacted my life. My first story is about new beginnings. I first met Greg thanks to Darcy Gill, a friend I've met at the university. I'd recently moved to Canada alone from India at the age of 17. Never been to a foreign country. Never seen snow. I was brand new. Hungry and curious. The scholarship made it possible for me to attend York University and because I was getting bored with the standard set of classes. I realized I could just walk into classes that were far more interesting. I learned that there was a word for this, auditing classes. I had little money back then. I needed to stretch my dollars far while learning as much as I could. As I was talking to Darcy, she tells me, you have to meet Greg. He's amazing. He teaches fourth year kinesiology courses and somehow he's managed to smuggle in meditation and martial arts into the curriculum. Come to one of his classes. One is called Body is Light. It covers meditation. Another is called Body as a Weapon. that covers martial arts. So one fateful day, I walk up to his classes in Bethune College at York University. I walk in late and embarrassed, and he greets me with so much enthusiasm. Hey, welcome to my class. He clasps my hand with both of his hands, smiles wide. It makes me feel so welcome. His ability to channel his enthusiasm and his care was so clear, so present as it is now. He was ecstatic that I was the president 
of the Meditation Club at York. His classes, as some of you may remember, were packed. They were so crazy packed that there was barely standing room at the start of the semester. And slowly, we'd make space by getting chairs from other classrooms. They were packed because this man knows how to teach and he cares deeply. They were packed because this man has a powerful presence and so much life he's cultivated over the years. He fed a hunger for students that could not be satiated with food. It was nourishment of the spirit. His classes were enlivening, powerful, an injection of life. And for me, it felt like inhaling oxygen for the first time. I was hooked. As someone that was new to Canada, Greg embodied to me what was quintessentially Canadian. Warm, friendly, open. But he was more than that. There was wisdom and care oozing out of him. Such playful wisdom. Greg, for as long as I've known him, has been a shit disturber. <laughs> In the best sense of the word. Maybe that's why I felt an instant connection with him. I always think of him as fiercely good, grounded, and unconventional, enthusiastic, and playful. I can recognize that full body laugh anywhere. That wide smile, that strong handshake. He lives with fire and life, even as it threatens to leave sometime very soon. But even back then, soon after I met him, I realized I'd met a very special man. He was shaping my life in ways I would not be able to understand fully for over a decade. He welcomed me freely into his home, introduced me to Jennifer, Hazel, and Karis. One of my highlights of our time together was the simple act of having tea at their home. For a young, lonely, far away from family, I remember feeling home. second story is about learning and life. I like Greg's classes so much, I continued to audit the same classes for years. The same fucking classes. For years. <laughs> Till I graduated myself. I even brought in a video camera to record the wisdom that he was freely sharing to anyone that would listen. He started and ended classes with the ceremonial ritual that you all saw Noah take us through. Every time, every class. That's how we started. This shit was dope. It takes a lot to smuggle meditation and martial arts into the university curriculum. To be such a good teacher that dozens of students lined up for his office hours routinely to send regular excited emails to his classes. <sighs> to inject friends, family, students and strangers with his contagious spirit. What was he teaching in these classes, you may ask? Well, the world of meditation and martial arts have a long lineage of extraordinary humans from various traditions who have dedicated their lives to the pursuit of self-mastery. Greg's classes were about these extraordinary humans and their lessons about life. There's one thing that I would learn that would have disproportional impact in my life that I would like to share with you about. You see, when he came into class, he would write these profound quotes on the blackboard in his large, diffusive handwriting. These quotes could be from the Buddha or seasoned military generals. 
but they were wonderful ways to deliver nuggets of wisdom to young and hungry minds. For some reason, it had a strong effect on me. And years later, when my co-founder and I were creating the five-minute journal, a guided gratitude journal, at the top of the page, we decided to include quotes. And the words of wisdom. And as I was picking the quotes for the journal, one by one, they would all come back to me. The many hundreds of quotes that Greg would put on that blackboard that sharpened my sense for truth and what would make an impact. This last month of my life has been a celebratory month. The five minute journal will go on to sell well over half a million copies. It's been well received by people I deeply respect. We also created several other products that apply useful research into simple, beautiful tools under the name Intelligent Change. A few weeks ago, I happily sold my stake in the company and have since started a new chapter in my life. If I had never met Greg, I might not have really learned how to appreciate and develop a taste for what great wisdom is the way I did. The products I created might not have the same quotes in them. The little things make all the difference. I've learned a lot from Greg, but most of all, Greg has taught me about life. Let me explain. You see life when you see a newborn baby full of aliveness, awe, the wonder, and pristine consciousness. And then, time happens. We go older, and slowly, time chips away at the life we have. The spirit, so strong and beautiful, starts to dim. You know the light is dim when you see someone who is breathing but you can sense in their eyes there is a deadness. There is a numbing. That deadness is a result of the spirit getting dim. But it is Greg that taught me to inject life into everything I do. It is Greg that encouraged me and inspired me to continue with my meditation practice. It is Greg that taught me to revel in my unconventionality. We all have our own nature, our own natural way we approach life. It has strength and intelligence when we tune into it. This past week, I got my Canadian citizenship. And it is Greg that taught me what it means to be Canadian. The second story is about life and the celebration of it because he has always been very big on that. Life is meant to be celebrated. final story is about graduation. Greg would start every class by walking in and writing on the blackboard. Destination graduation. Constantly reminding us of what the goal was. What Greg doesn't know is that motto, destination graduation, actually got me to graduate. I nearly dropped out of school twice. 
I was too flighty, too bored, too frustrated, too much energy to be contained within the education system. Somehow, I managed the discipline to stay the course. And when finally came time to graduate, I requested Greg that he would stand in instead of my parents, since they lived in India. It was a precious gift to have Greg attend my graduation and shake my hand enthusiastically, as he always does. The end of that chapter. I still have that card he gave me at the end of the ceremony. A beautiful card, the butterfly on top. It read, Destination, graduation. It seems fitting that I am sharing now this because to me, death is the graduation of life. It is life's change agent. It clears the old and makes way for the new set of students of life. Because in this great game of life, we are all students. And life is always patiently teaching. The question is, are we learning? Are we taking notes? Who's in our study group? I ask these questions because these are the questions that Greg would ask. Destination? Graduation. I want to leave you all with one quote that he often shared by Hunter S. Thompson. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, Wow! What a ride! My God, what a ride this man has been on. I am deeply grateful for a teacher, a friend, a guide, a brother to have steadied my hand on a matter. And right here, right now, before Greg's last ever lecture, I want us all to take a moment to celebrate his life. For all the magic and goodness it has brought us, he will be deeply missed. bit like I'm at my own memorial service though. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean in my in my age cohort this is kind of a fantasy and I get to live it out. <laughs> Especially being in church where I mean where else would it happen? Thank you so much. <clears throat> but uh, you must know there probably won't be a memorial service. I, I'm trying to donate my body to uh, the U of T med school and they asked me why I wanted to do that and I said well I don't have to stop teaching just because I'm dead. <laughs> But, but, <laughs> but, but I do reserve the right to give my corpse its own nickname because I know med school students can be very cruel. So, <clears throat> but uh, I am very deeply moved by what's been said about me by your presence here. I mean, you know, on. I looked up on Wikipedia what October 20th was noted for, and really there wasn't anything special. <laughs> so it seemed like a good day to go out and have fun. So I'm, uh, I'm so grateful that you came and you've uplifted me. Um, knowing that when I go into free fall, I lose track of time. And because I came from a family of great talkers, 
we could be here till the stars came out and the sun rose tomorrow. So rather than do that, <clears throat> I'm not going to torment you with uh, going off on a million tangents as I like to, although I am glad that the speakers all, in one way or another, called attention to my absolute uh, bad attitude towards authority. Uh, uh, I've never done anything that I was told to do. I've only done things I decided to do. And uh, it helps to have impaired hearing. I, I can't hear the word no. So that's very useful, especially in marital disputes. But, oh, I never heard you say that. Uh, but, uh, but it's also useful in dealing with complex uh, institutions where people's fates and destinies are subject to the rules and regulations and the administrators. And that so many people who are professionals and take pride in their work often think the work has to do with files, it has to do with efficiency, it has to do with uh, watching the bottom line and keeping, keeping uh, the costs down as much as possible. And they forget that in fact all institutions are there to serve. They're there to serve the people who need them, need their services. And that can't be truer of any place than higher education, except one, and that's in healthcare. Now, I've been disgustingly healthy most of my life. So for me, my recent diagnosis last year made me a tourist in the healthcare system I had never studied firsthand. So many of my students in kinesiology had gone on to become healthcare professionals, and I always encouraged them to have empathy for people. But now suddenly, I was the object of attention within the healthcare system, visiting 10 or 12 different specialists about my condition. So part of that will be in my speech. I, I probably should get right down to it then to tell you all the other things. But I will say that uh, you never feel as fully human as you do when you've had a fatal diagnosis. And that uh, one of the things I did say to all the healthcare professionals is that I'm not afraid of anything, I'm not worried about anything, but don't sugarcoat anything. So uh, let me just start because I picked these topics because I thought they were important to all of us and that my hope is that you will be so indelibly imprinted with what you've heard, experienced, and done today that you'll be thinking about things, let these meanings resonate in your lives day after day as you come to terms with the last things in your own life when that time comes, which I hope is far, far away. I mean, my wish for everybody in here, including me, is that we can all blow out the candles on our 105th birthday cakes. Okay, well, let me talk about healing and happiness in a broken world. Let's start with our broken world, which you know so well, I know so well, we're surrounded by every day. But let me just give a quick review because we have to talk about the context. Every cell, every living organism responds to the environment it finds itself in. And so let me just pull together a few of the things that we as living organisms, as human beings, are immersed in and what effects that has upon us. Okay, let's start with the broken world. Climate disruption signals cascading environmental disasters starting out in our lifetime and in the next generation, or two, or four, or 40. Millions are already starting to be displaced by climate change and the struggles in the fight over diminishing water, resources, and land. Acidic oceans, vast forests on fire in the Amazon, drought, floods, ocean rise, starvation. Millions of species are dying away as we sit here today, right now, unbalancing untold ecosystems. We ultimately face the extinction of our species as nature reacts to the human-made degradation and our sustenance once counted on as stable, that environment is now gone. Even faster catastrophe could be nuclear war with poisoning and vast human annihilation that way, something I grew up with when I was a child. This past year, we've witnessed genocide in Myanmar, 
in the Amazon, and this week an invasion against the Syrian Kurds to move them off their land. The West hears far too remotely of the plight of the Uyghurs in China. Canada is finally focused on the violence of missing and murdered women of First Nations, but genuine help with policy and resources must follow. We've heard the truth, but there's no reconciliation. The UN submitted a report to the General Assembly a couple of days ago on the housing conditions on half of the indigenous population of Canada who live on reserves. The report says, and I quote, they are living in really the most abhorrent housing conditions worldwide. So though similar to housing for indigenous populations in other rich countries, so indigenous peoples are under attack everywhere and we have to worry. I mean, I one time daydreamed of making a t-shirt that said, make North, North America great again, let's go back to 1491. So what is it the problem with indigenous reserves. Well, they're overcrowded, they have no indoor plumbing, they have substandard sanitation and clean water. Infrastructure is missing. A Métis Cree scholar reminds us that, as he quotes, this is the reflection of the residual effects of colonial displacement. So the land acknowledgement we started off with is about our realization yeah. that we name places after people who are gone. If you say Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you're speaking First, La First Nations languages. And in fact, half of the place names in Canada are given by indigenous peoples, not by Euro-Canadians. A broken world means persecutions here and around the world of people abused and assaulted, of class structures and political as well as corporate systems that support the repellent accumulation by theft and obscene profits of vast amounts of wealth in the hands of a tiny few. In this way, right now, billions are condemned to soul-crushing poverty with no hope of relief. And of the extermination of their rights, well, no dependable means of support, no clean water, no shelter, meager food sources, no medicine, no comfort, no healing in both the richest countries in the world and in the poorest. So it's a global phenomenon. A broken world means the prevalent abuse of children by families, by faith leaders, in school, and from sports personnel. While government justice and all of us too often look away, we have no idea how vast that problem actually is. And yet we express concerns about the next generation and do so little about it. Throwaway youth are incarcerated in numerous, often profit-making penal colonies called jails. It's an industry. They provide jobs. Racist business practices continue in hiring, in banking, in capital support that keep people in what is considered their place within the pecking order of the status quo. And your skin complexion has a lot to do with what your availability of capital or loans is going to be. You and I, all of us here, we're winners, actually. Just look around the room and you'll see this is, this is what the winners in society look like in a broken world. Because we have workplaces. We have places where we're valued. We have skills that are compensated for. We're not considered redundant. We're not considered throwaways. The losers don't have these jobs and we're never in contention in their vast numbers. The competition for jobs was rigged against contract gig workers, low employment, temporary agency people, and a large number who are just considered an underclass, redundant tossaways. It's real. And in fact, if you read the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, which I highly recommend as a must read, on chapter three, when he talks about work, he talks about the fact that although people are predicting 2050 or 2060, half of the jobs that exist now will be gone. He's saying, no, AI and algorithms will replace most of those jobs by 2030. So in fact, what do you educate people for? For a world where they can't have a job? They can't buy a house? They can't support their families? They have to live with their parents and grandparents? North American politics is tainted with fascism rising from the 20th century that exterminated almost a billion people. And it's now flourishing 
in our politics. We'll see evidence of it tomorrow in the election. Authoritarian control degrades populations so that the citizens are subjugated into objects to be manipulated. We have accustomed ourselves to a world of brutality that we accept as normal. We find, therefore, the need to protect ourselves with personal walls against these threats. Consequently, all of us contribute to making and sustaining this brutal world by accepting a broken world as normal, as acceptable, when it is clearly unacceptable. We are conditioned from youth to prop up social hierarchies in which a few are considered so much more worthy and superior to all the others. We also accept that a rampant consumer society is one we must participate in, even though we know it's damaging to us, to our children, to the environment, to our social relations. Those walls cost money, and they're not just on the Southern American border. Are we not mostly marching along in our own lives, trying to shut out the awareness of other people's needs? We're minding our own business, literally. We're not getting involved beyond those interests, and we're letting those at the top make all the important, largest decisions for our entire society, like on climate action, on massive weapons dealing, on skyrocketing corporate costs, on immigration and sanctuary for refugees, people who are exiles, that may include us someday, probably not me. We're taught and conditioned to obey the law, to seek careers, to make enough income and enjoy the comforts of life. But we see that our world is broken. That breaking, in fact, disrupts our connections to other people. I mean, if you look around this room, how many people have you met here? And yet, I can tell you from looking at all of you, all of you are worthy of knowing and have infinite you know, and vast riches and potential that I would love to be able to connect to everybody else that's in here. Together in communities, we could collectively work to change big things. But we're conditioned to be just individuals with no effective political power and agency. So make sure you vote tomorrow if you haven't so far. This disconnection keeps us broken. We're fragmented in ourselves, and our communities are fragmented consequently, because communities are simply a collection of all of us together. There are those of us doing political action, taking to the streets, including the children on climate crisis like Greta Thunberg, or those fighting for a livable wage like the uh, Free the Slaves Fight for 15, $15 minimum payment because many people who are working full time do not have enough money to pay their bills, especially with rising housing costs in this city. It's despicable. In our jobs, many of us can work with others to affect useful remedies for, to the social and technological problems we're actually facing. These actions give us hope, but we have to have a sense of responsibility, meaning our ability to respond to it. But we need always to keep the human condition in view. We humans are born with the innate potential to do the worst and the best to each other, to the environment, and to ourselves. We're a mix of potential good, evil, greed, compassion, hate, love, ignorance, and wisdom. Terence, the ancient Roman playwright 2,200 years ago wrote, I am human. Nothing human is alien to me. All of what we are as humans is at play in our own lives. We individually are capable of any human behavior that's ever existed, the worst and the best, the saints and the demons. But there is a way out of this life sentence of being forever broken by a world that's broken and that we sustain by accepting it. At birth, before we've attached, before we've absorbed the brokenness, we are whole as persons. Whole means entire, unhurt, uninjured, safe, healthy, sound, genuine, perfect, flawless. All of us were born that way. We all have the potential to awaken to the original condition we arrived when we began as persons. 
we have a capacity to awaken that same wholeness. And that choice is something we can choose in any given moment of our lives. This is what I call healing. I'm going to distinguish in this lecture between the idea of healing and wholeness and the idea of cure or fixing health. And it's an important distinction. So let's consider this. As Jenny Holzer, the American installation artist, said in one of her truisms, much was decided before you were born. Okay, just let that sink in. Much was decided before you were born. People were even talking about your gender before you were born. People had biases for what you are or what the surprise they got. But you were born into a society where, in fact, a lot of the machinery of our culture and our values was already at play. That means that everything around us, even our words, were created long before we were born. Our language, our tools, our technology, our political structures, our ideas, our art forms, our modes of transportation, our science, all of these elements help to sustain humans generation to generation over millennia. Humans over all this time have tried to resolve problems, tried to heal a broken world, and to get on with many, many inventions, techniques, tools, practices, faith, community. I mean, we've heard about meditation. The other is medicine. Let's talk about that. The English language derives a great deal from Greek and Latin. In fact, 70% of our words in English are derived from those two languages. So we've picked up a sense of how the world is by the words we use every day, not recognizing what effect they have on us. The Latin word medicus for doctor and for medicine uses the root med, M-E-D, in the Proto-Indo-European, which is about six or 7,000 years old. The root word means to take appropriate measure. So this is about diagnosis. It's about treatment. It's about healing, advising, prevention of disease. A measure of a patient's illness is to discover the imbalance that's led to the illness. The desire is to help the body recover an equilibrium. The physician advises on treatment as a remedy, which is another word using the root word med, and measures out the dosage or medication. So a doctor measures the degree of your symptoms and the cause of the illness. They also measure out what treatment is necessary to bring your health back to an optimal level. And then they prescribe by measuring out the dosages of the medications or the herbs or the oils or the essences that will help you. The caduceus that shows the twin snakes around the central staff shows that doctors in the ancient world used snake venom to shock the immune system. That meant they had control over life and death. Too little, it wouldn't cure, the patient would die. Too much, the physician would kill the patient. That's why Hippocrates says, do no harm in the oath that doctors take. Actually, they don't take it. It's read out to them and they all say, yay, or something equivalent. Okay. <clears throat> Meditation is also from the same root to measure. That is, the individual measures their thoughts and feelings during contemplation. So meditation, medicine. See? Okay. <laughs> because while they're contemplating, they are measuring their thoughts, the extremes of passionate emotions. And they also measure their calmly balanced thoughts until they can find an equilibrium by meditating. In medicine and meditation, the practitioners are trying to restore balance. One of the problems of medicine, whether it's Eastern or Western, is the assumption that addressing the imbalance is, for most practitioners, sufficient for optimal health. You need to find a rare physician who will look beyond simply trying to correct the condition. But we can distinguish between healing as restoring wholeness and the more basic fixing or curing a person. You can have a painful, fatal disease and still experience healing, and with that, find that you are, in fact, happy. 
Conversely, you can be a healthy person and yet be unhappy and still seeking healing for that inner hurt, the deeper one, the heart that's carrying a secret that needs to be unlocked. And the reality of time, well, what happens to us in the weeks, months, and years of our lives is permanent and irreversible. If you're diagnosed with a fatal disease or have a car accident, you cannot unwish that. This is the reality. You can't go back in time. But we also operate with our memory and we engage in remembering, reconstituting our life, which is like reorganizing our lives in the way we see ourselves and the world around us and the relationships that we have. So what we all do is live in our reality as time moves forward or time moves through us. But simultaneously, we live in our memory such that we can remember happiness and feel health even when we are in trouble, even when we're in t severe pain, and even when we're dying as I am. I was going to subtitle this a dead man talking, but I thought that <laughs> might not work. Actually, I asked Jennifer on my last day, uh, the Tibetans believe that your consciousness leaves the body from the highest point the body is at. So I said, please don't let me lay in the bed. Sit me up in a chair so I can die talking. Okay, so this year I've had many times remembered being fully healthy, which was true for most of my life. In fact, as a young man, I never thought I'd live to see 40, let alone 74, and so it's all kind of a surprise to me. <laughs> Anyhow, I told you I had a bad attitude towards authority. Death came by before I was 40. He said, it's time to go, bud. I said, no, I'm busy. Come back later. So, <laughs> Anyhow. I know he's at the front door, but I always go at the back. <clears throat> so, even when I know there's no cure or fix for me, the first words out of the urologist's mouth is, well, it's fatal, nothing's going to help you, no surgery, no radiation, no chemo. But, let me ask you this. What is healing? I'm here because... Thank goodness for traditional medicine and my practitioners and the researchers who have discovered the miracle drug that's doing its miracle by having me stand before you right now and speak to you, because otherwise I would have been gone by New Year's. Uh, I lost 50 pounds in six weeks. It was pretty serious, and it still is. In the remembering, we can concentrate our awareness on the layers of the self, the emotional self that I am, the intellectual self that I am, the spiritual self that I am, and the physical self that stands before you with stage four prostate cancer fully metastasized through the bones and lymph nodes. I stand before you recovering that feeling of the life force that's open-hearted and open-minded that connects us with all living forms. This is the life force, the wholeness we were born with. And luckily for me, I guess because I didn't ever turn out to be normal and never did what anybody else ever told me to, I could carry that original wholeness from my childhood into every relationship I've ever had. So that, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> so that for me, you're all my brothers and sisters and are as alive as I am or ever hope to be. And so it's a rare pleasure, I thank my beautiful adult children whom I admire so much for making it possible for me to tell you that today because you are precious beyond measure and I have not enough words or even feelings to convey that to you. You just have to know that. Okay, so take it on faith. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> okay, back to the speech. We got to get out of here. <laughs> I don't dare look over at Jennifer, anyhow. All right, so. My culture taught me and you the dualistic belief system that separates us into mind and body. We've been injured by that ideology because it's arbitrary and untrue. 
This is the opposite of wholeness, and it's a struggle to integrate mind-body against our cultural momentum that pushes us to see ourselves as a body or as a mind or even as a soul, but something that is not integrated, something that's not whole. And that's what I differentiate between healing and fixing it with a cure. The health system is oriented towards treating the body mostly and separately from the whole person. The mind or emotional state is also treated, but in isolation. Coming up with many superb treatments, such as my own miracle drug enabling me to talk to you today, the doctors, the researchers, the scientists, and the hospitals do incredible work. I've met noble souls there, but not all of them. But they do incredible work in the area of restoring, restoring health or assisting you to cope with a disease. But today, I want to look at healing with you because I want to offer you what I've learned. So it's not a lecture. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to give you any lessons. I'm not repeating other people's ideas. This is what I've learned, especially in the last year, which has been a very harsh year for me in terms of pain, suffering, anxiety. As I said, I'm not afraid of anything, but I do have, you know, I do have concerns about what's going to happen to the people I love after I'm gone. I mean, um, yeah, there's going to be a hole. Uh, time doesn't heal anything. Just what happens after you lose somebody that's important to you, there's a hole in your life that lives there forever. And nothing is going to ever cure that. It's just that you get used to it. And your pain or anguish about losing a loved one who's beloved to you, maybe only to you, is the measure of how much you cared about them. So my suggestion is, after I'm gone, just remember the best and forget the rest. When living with extensive bone metastasis and stage four cancer, with unremitting pain, there's fear and anxiety with the wish to stop the pain and even a kind of longing for death, just to put a stop to it all. Uh, I can foresee eventually that those, that longing might become preferable uh, life gives you things to a certain point, and then it starts taking them away. And at some point, as somebody who's been self-reliant all my life, to have to be totally dependent on my family members and caregivers to care for me is going to be a very difficult challenge. I think I'm up to it. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I love being alive, I have to say that. <laughs> so, uh, I, hoping for a fix or a cure actually aggravates the suffering for those, I think, in my position, and believe me, going to chemo and going for my injections or my treatments, you see people who feel crushed and defeated by the pain they're experiencing. As it moves into the center of your life, you can't care that much about anybody else. And you also see how they need healing when they're getting fixing. Health professionals are upset for you. You know, I have... I have Specialists and my oncologist, uh, you know, the, the radiation oncologist, even the technicians, the staff, I can see they're upset. They're looking at me and they, there's an anguish because they know, they know I'm not going to be there that much longer. Loss of self-care and loss of self-direction as the disease progresses accentuates my acute loneliness. And it also progresses so that it becomes very troubling and I have to control my apprehension to focus on the quality of the moment. And even if you do get a cure, those scars of the crisis can stay with you for the rest of your life. If you were me, what would you look for? I ask you that. If you were me, you got a stage four cancer. You know, the doctors won't tell you how much longer they, that you're going to live, but I'm sure in the staff room they probably have a pool going. <laughs> no, I, I, I hope I can outstrip it all. I, intend, I told my 98-year-old mother I intend to be the Guinness World Book of Records longest surviving cancer victim. All right, so if you were me, what would you look for? Well, you may have experienced this yourself or cared for somebody who has. Healing is to make whole again. The sense of being whole and feeling connected to everybody else, just
just as I feel connected to each one of you now, whether you can see me connecting to you or not. It's real. It's actual. It's beneath your feet. It's at the top of your heads. It's going right through your heart. Okay. So to repeat and clarify, healing is to make whole again, the sense of being whole and feeling connected. This isn't necessarily our concept of health in the conventional way. So to repeat and to clarify, I'll say, one can be fatally ill as I am, and yet healing. One can be fully healthy and yet broken, not healed. One can be cured and yet not healed and still seeking healing. The paradox speaks to the different nature of healing and health. Nurses, for example, study from texts that distinguish between the two. There's a new form of nursing out. I just read a textbook on it. I was speaking with Randy Ugolino, who teaches nurses at uh, Cambria College, that integrative nursing is a completely different orientation. One of the things we have to say, 90% of the nurses of the world are female. So we have to look at the fact that we live in a gendered society that shunts some people into one profession and others into another, and we accept it. So remember when I said you either fulfilled or betrayed some people's expectations by what you were when you were born? Oh, I really wanted a boy, but I got a girl. I really wanted a girl, but I got a boy. Healing elevates our sense of belonging in all of the dimensions we embody, physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, familial, social, political, eco-global, all of the eight dimensions we now all share, intersecting, connected, alive, every one of those spheres, dynamic spheres, we're actually participating in right now by being here together. Every thought, every feeling, every deed, every intention, every worry, every happiness, has a life force component. Our attention to this life force can reveal our wholeness, our sense of feeling healed. We all have the potential to seek healing in this way. And healthcare professionals can be trained, although they're not now, to help identify this type of healing and assist and support in it. This is not something that's done in med schools now, but surely it is beginning to emerge as the wisdoms of the world, the indigenous wisdoms, the Eastern wisdoms, the Western wisdoms, begin to converge into something that supports us all as human beings. Because as I've said before, under the skin, we're all equals. As Buddha points out, and uh, of course my, <laughs> my friend Noah, pain is the chief problem. What did Buddha say, the first tenet? Life is suffering. When pain dominates our consciousness, our desperation for relief reduces our critical abilities, and that makes us susceptible to charlatans who prey on our vulnerability with false promises to relieve the pain, physical, emotional, intellectual, or even spiritual. There's a long history of quackery up to this very day among gurus, shamans, doctors, drug scientists, and health self-improvement entrepreneurs. Diet books, self-help treatises, miraculous cures, all the snake oil from the 19th century couldn't hold a candle to what's being offered to us to cure our views. All you have to do is watch YouTube or go on social media and you're gonna be hit with ads for something that's promising to heal you and make you happy. But you have to pay for it, okay? What I'm offering you in terms of healing, you don't have to pay anything for. You have to make a choice. I got my diagnosis about a year ago, and since then, after the scans, the anti-hormonal drugs, the bone-building injections, the palliative radiation, both high beam, external beam, intense, and moderate dosages, all the pain management drugs that I have to go on daily, I've experienced the curative benefits that have enabled a nearly normal life for me for these past, you know, nine months or so. And I'm grateful for that. Believe me, I would much rather be here than to be on some med school student's table getting joked about, oh, this guy looks really bad. 
or no, they should be saying, he looks so buff, he must have really worked out a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I used to be a mountain, but I'm off the juice now. Okay. Anyhow, the healing that I'm experiencing at this very minute comes from you all. That's a fact. You're healing me right now. I'm being energized by, there's a lot of love in here, but you're channeling it, you're gathering it, you're storing it, and then you're offering it to me. And not just the people who are presenting. All of you who are here are honoring me with your gift of your presence. But the healing that comes from all of you is embodied, most of all for me, by my wife Jennifer, by my daughter Karis and her fiance Kevin, by Azen and Savannah. I know you. Hey, how are you? There? Hey, wow, <laughs> wonderful. Surround, I'm surrounded by people who love me every day at every contact. From my friends here on stage, UJ, wow, I, I haven't pulled out a handkerchief in so long except to blow my nose, and here I am trying to dry my eyes because I was so touched. What Steven said, my friend Emily, Noah, my former student, now taking over the course that I taught. What, what an elation for me, an exuberant, you know, offering of their, of their appreciation. And I'm so grateful to them because my students were my best teachers. All right, I feel purposeful. I feel alive. You know, you're uplifting me right at this minute. I take pleasure in breathing, believe it or not. I don't have to meditate about it because when I take a breath, wow, it's a surprise. <laughs> I told my kids, we're not celebrating any more birthdays because if I wake up in the morning, open my eyes and get out of bed, that's my birthday. So I get 365. And if you are healed, you'll feel that way too because the, re the real world doesn't allow us to escape from the acknowledgement that none of us knows if we're going to live to see the bed we left this morning. And it's not just me with a fatal diagnosis. I mean, I, I accept pity because I would feel sorry for anybody I knew who was dying. But the reality is we're all in the same boat. I told my doctor, kind of shocked her actually, the oncologist. I said, well, I feel sorry for all doctors. She said, oh, why is that? I said, well, because in the end they lose all their patients. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Took a bit by surprise. <sighs> that was in second year med school. Uh, okay. I take pleasure in walking in a cool breeze on an autumn sunny afternoon. No better. I, I don't bother wearing an, bringing an umbrella with me. I love to feel the rain on my face. It means I'm not below ground or stuck on some uh, uh, autopsy table. I... I I love the, the Simpsons doctor who's got the billboard that says, if I kill you, you don't pay. <laughs> of course, that's the American healthcare system. What can I say about that? <laughs> All right, bear that in mind. My dreams are more intense these days as I sleep. Maybe it's the drugs, I'm not sure. But, but they're extremely, I think when you realize, you know, it's not something vague in the future. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen sooner than you think that the dreams become really, really vivid. I'm happy to still be dreaming, and not as an omen or a message from beyond. Uh, remember, if you want to find out if it's a dream or if it's real, try to take your right hand and put it through the palm of your left hand. If you can't do it, you're, you're not dreaming. If you can do it, you're definitely dreaming. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's my message. I've come to accept acceptance. The wholeness, if I can achieve it completely, is very much paradoxical. My experience of healing is within the context of dying because I accept my fatal diagnosis, my limited time to spend with people I love, my wife, my children, my friends, and my limited resources to engage meaningfully in helping to help out a broken world. This is my last lecture because it's my only opportunity to tell people that yes, you can heal yourself and that it's worth it. It's worth it to make those choices. You need healing, so heal thyself. 
I feel fulfilled knowing that I can find care about me, deep listening and human touch from my dear ones, from my sense of belonging to a communities, by my participation in several communities at once. There's no day that passes by that was just another day for me. Yesterday isn't a day, it's gone. Tomorrow isn't a day, it's just an envision. But today, now, this is my day. This is my only day. And I get to share it with you. And because you came to share yours, your day with me. Organized by my amazing gang of four. In my years of reading spiritual literature since my youth up to day, I had ideas of enlightenment, of samsara, nirvana, redemption. Okay. I have to say my health care crisis released me every day to live with meaning and purpose and without fear or worry. It's an amazing, clarifying experience to live without fear. My health crisis triggered an awakening to a continuously abiding happiness that's more than just pleasure or enjoyment. The root word for happiness relates to its random occurrence. Happiness is a happening. Because of healing, my happiness is different than just a momentary happening. I don't look for moments to be happy. I experience when it comes. It's instead an abiding, enduring, sustaining, and fortifying happiness. So paradoxically, my fatal illness has brought me to this kind of happiness through the healing that it actually triggered. Because I didn't have unlimited time to wonder about what I was going to do. It's now or never. I've always said, my students who are here have heard me say this so many times, life belongs to those who dare to live it intensively. <laughs> All right, I really recognized that I was the source of my own unhappiness so that, or that I was being crushed by times that made me leave the USA because of its intense racial hatred and the war that was going on, always going on. In fact, I decided that in my lifetime, racial hatred in the United States was probably going to intensify and not ameliorate, and how true I was in recognizing that at a young age. But those specific experiences of my broken world led me here to Toronto in the 1970s. I was in pursuit of healing at all times, but I learned a lot. And I can honestly say that while often happy with my family and my profession, my students and my experiences, that in fact, I was troubled all the time and not feeling entirely whole. There's still something missing. I wasn't whole at all. I was always caught between thinking of the past and hoping for the future while I was living in the present only occasionally and rarely. This year, knowing that my, my time is limited, I'm up against the end of time for me. These are my last days, you know, and I doubt if most of you will ever see me again. So I have to say, I'm up against the end of time and I'm up against the end of belonging to all of you. That when it's time to go, I must leave. I'm now free to unleash my awareness of each rich moment with undivided attention, including this moment here and now. What I'm losing in my quantity of life, I'm gaining and I've been rewarded with in the quality of the moments of my life, in the depth and the intensity of my relationships, in my gratitude for you being in my life and for the people who have made my life worthwhile that I could be both a universal donor and a universal recipient. I was happy to give to anybody whatever I had, whatever they needed, and I was happy to receive anybody as they were, whoever they were, wherever they were, and whatever they did. And so that kind of balance prepared me for the healing that my disease actually triggered. I can now with full purpose do whatever I see possible in helping to address the illness of society, our broken world. My life as it is now, in fact, has a positive outcome because I feel healing taking place in me every day in my completion of my own wholeness and self-transformation. My life project 
has been turning continuously outward towards the world now since my diagnosis, trying to engage outside my own small concerns and my little life. Time becomes less important for me, but consciousness is more important because consciousness helps me to accept what must be and energizes me to engage with the life forces within me and to mesh those with the life forces of those I'm lucky enough to meet, greet, encounter, work with, love, care about, all of you. Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson's quote has helped me to understand a way of being an instrument of healing to myself, to others, and in the world. But in a way, I hope you'll find paradoxical, and we've heard some elements before as the other presenters have talked about different focal points on it, of our topics. I hope you'll understand. I've got something, I think, my own take on it. Emerson said, for every minute you're angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness in terms of the physiological consequences of anger. But I want to call into question about our relationship to our own emotions. Because this idea is usually seen as a call to suppress anger or negativity. Let's consider it in a different way, though. So stay with me. Instead of the Western dualist notion of one or the other in terms of opposites, with one idea being the winner and one idea being the loser, I want to draw on the essence of healing and reconfigure Emerson's quote because for every minute you're angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. Well, there's a choice here. You can choose to be happy rather than to get angry, and it's a good choice to make as a habit. As a life habit, I believe in taking a realist and positive attitude. You know, I'm Polish, so Polish people, the optimists say the glass is half full, the pessimists say the glass is half empty, the Polish realist says, hey, I got a glass. <laughs> So there's a choice here. You can choose to be happy rather than to get angry, and that's a good choice to make as a habit. But nevertheless, in the moment between stimulus and response, anger is too often seen as needing control, as expressing negativity, as requiring management. We have anger management classes. But there are times that you must unleash your sacred anger to protect boundaries, to protect values, to intervene with any person or policy causing violence. You can't be a spectator in your own life. You're in the arena every day. And your choices, your thoughts, your feelings, your intentions, your actions, your omissions, your decisions affect everybody else. And there is a time when you have to sacrifice your own personal happiness in order to have a voice and express your anger about resetting the boundaries that have been violated around you. Don't be a spectator when other people are being demeaned, degraded, debased, amused. Okay. You shouldn't do that. I'm likely to go off script and we'll be here for another six hours. Uh, I'll, I'll try to wind it up. I, I know. Okay. We're, right. Okay. We're still in the same time zone. Uh, okay. At this point, you have to sacrifice your happiness, your comfort, your calm, your positivity, your productivity, even your balance by awakening that anger. I'm giving you permission to be angry when it's appropriate. Because anger is an emotion that's felt when truth is being suppressed or lied about. Anger makes changes that need to be made, that break silences that need to be broken. Your voice is a presence that protects the vulnerable and demands honesty, spoken out loud whether people like it or not. Sometimes you have to tell people things they don't want to hear or show them things they don't want to see or make them do things they don't want to do. And that's when you need to fuel that sacred anger and direct it towards those obstacles and barriers that are keeping other people degraded and oppressed. 
in terror, in suffering, in painful emotion that's undeserved. Because we're connected, all of us together, we must sometimes sacrifice our own personal happiness to address the broken world we realize is the one we're living in. This sacred anger is a healing component towards wholeness. In a broken world, you cannot have, nor is it acceptable to perform a script of relentless gratitude and unfelt positivity, as many of the cult leaders would have you do. It's false to present yourself as somebody who's a totally positive person and never loses your temper with anybody. Because you're going to witness things that are completely wrong. And you need to step out of your comfort zone, sacrifice that for your sacred anger to be unleashed on them. The world needs so much more from you than you've given it so far. Healing anyone... Healing ourselves requires something beyond what Western or Eastern health science can do because these science-based practices do not usually validate consciousness within their parameters. Awareness, and even the awareness of being human, is not often part of the practice of medicine, no matter where you are. So let's look at the emergence of a new kind of science where, in fact, Harvard even set up a center for placebo studies. Dr. Peck has given research over to looking at neuropeptides, which are the connections between your thoughts and your emotions. Bruce Lipton talks about the biology of belief, where, in fact, our cells respond to our mindset, our feelings, our interior environment. Our cells are in the environment we create for them. And if you want to go one step further, the 2009 Nobel Prize went to Elizabeth Blackburn and her colleagues who discovered telomeres in health. Telomeres are this small one ten thousandth of the weight of DNA at the very end of it. And they're little flagellates that grow longer the more positive the environment they're in, and they shorten the more negative the environment is. So, in fact, those telomeres determine the length of the life of your cells. So we, to a great extent, are either creating longevity for ourselves or shortening our lives by what we continually think. And so your healing is really up to you. So what we can awaken, vivid feelings of aliveness, of a self uninjured and undamaged and whole. Can we awaken that? Do you want to awaken that? Yes, this is what I did. At the moment my doctor told me I had a fatal cancer and why, I handled handled it in a way I believe in which I never felt out of control because I instantly accepted it. For decades before, because of my interest in authors ancient and modern, writing about the meaning of life and the ending of life, and knowing that I would die at some point and having experience in martial arts, I had prepared myself for just that moment so I could do it nobly and exit life laughing, hopefully, probably talking. The medical profession needs to look at this practice. There are ways of preparing people so that you can remove the fear. And as I go into the weekly or sessions around chemotherapy, you can see the fear and terror on people's faces as they're crushed by both pain and their, their lack of hope. There are ways to encourage the healing I'm talking to you about today. One is to practice the most humane of encounters. It's to plunge into the deep, deep attention, deep listening, deep caring, and deep empathizing. Those deeps, those depths you all are capable of. So take time to engage with people. For listening, you know you're listening when you're not doing anything else but giving that person the fullest of your attention. And miraculous things happen. People will surprise you when they feel that they've really been listened to. James Baldwin, an eloquent witness of the broken world, identifies the scarce reality, though he implies potential for each of us to experience healing. He says, quote, the world is held together by the love and compassion of a very few people. My appeal to you who are among those very few people, otherwise you wouldn't be here today. My appeal to you 
and to myself is that we initiate the joy of effort to become those folks who co-create such deep encounters with those who need healing, which is all of us. And I'd just like to finish with my land acknowledgement. There's an old Inuit song, although they didn't inhabit this part of southern Ontario. And it goes like this. I think over again my small adventures, my fears, these small ones that seemed so big at the time, for all the vital things I had to get, all the things I had to reach, and yet there's only one great thing, the only thing, to live to see the great day that dawns and the light that fills the world. And today, in this place, it's not the spotlights. It's the light you are generating to me that I bask in as I'm healed by your presence. Thank you so much. So I want to address this like unique and pretty incredible place you're in. Like the question I'm asking is, is about this vantage you have, because we are seekers of truth, you and I. Right? We are, and I am deeply curious because like this 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 place you're in is is it's an intense place with. A key focus, as you mentioned, every day is kind of a birthday. Right now, sitting where you're sitting, what matters? Well, I, I have to say one thing is I never betrayed my body by treating it as an object. You know, I think a key of integrating self is by, I mean, I'm never, I've never been a big fan of battling cancer, of making your body the enemy. My body is my precious vehicle. It's who I am. It's, it's all I've known. It's my place in the world. You know, why would I want to revile it? Or why would I want to hate it? Or why would I want to see it as something that's killing me? Or why would I want to even fight against it? So I think that's really important. And the other thing is that, um, unlike everybody else here, I cannot do anything about the quantity of time that I have left. I mean, I can't, uh, Jennifer and I were in a, a Gilda's Club writing group and uh, the teacher instructed uh, all of us there, I, I mean, I'm the only guy and most of the women are in there, like early to mid 20s, early 30s, very young kids, a 20 year old has has had brain cancer and has to wear a scarf over the scar. Uh, another 25-year-old just had a double mastectomy. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very humbling to be among people who are suffering so greatly and have, have terrifying fears about not ever living through all the years that I've had to live through. But I will say this, I can't do anything about the quantity of time so you shift your locus of attention to the quality of the time. To not just pretending like you're going to pay attention to the here and now, but really living in the here and now, feeling the life force going through you. I mean, I tell myself every day in the shower, I mean, after I, after I take a nice hot shower and clean myself off, I flip it over to pure cold and scream, I'm glad to be alive. <laughs> 
And I think in a way, I kind of, I, I, that's kind of an image for me of what death must be like. It must be like suddenly having the shower go from hot to cold. But I don't know, maybe it's more like evaporating water drops. I'm, I'll, I'll give you a full report on it if I can come back later. <laughs> you know, so meet me here at midnight, the, the one year after I've died, and I'll, I'll tell you all about it. <clears throat> no, but, no, but honestly, it's about, it's about a capacity they always had, and, and Eugene O'Kelly, who wrote that book, Chasing Daylight, which I love, because it was his record. It, he kept a journal of the last hundred days of his life, which was his widow published after he had died. And a 14-year-old child, he was, you know, in his early 50s and had been planning on taking an early retirement. His golf game went a little off, and uh, he went to his doctor, sent him to a neuroscientist who tested him and said, you got to fatal brain cancer, you've got three months, maybe 100 days at most. And that book, Chasing Daylight, he, in his journal, he talks about the fact that, not that he was glad he was dying, but that his diagnosis forced him to develop a mindset he never had while he was alive, healthy, and normal. And that I can tell you this, my only gift to you, I have so little to offer, but I can tell you, you all can, before you even walk out of this church, make a decision that every moment you ever think of it, or think of me, or think about somebody you love, or think about where you are, or take a breath, or have, have something bad happen, that you can recognize that, that the experience is you being alive in the world, and you should savor that that our feelings come and go, but they are important. All of our emotions are sacred. But my encouragement was to you, in a broken world, sometimes you have to trade that personal happiness for the ferocious, furious anger that a situation has evoked from you. Because as I said, you're not spectators in the stands. You're players in the arena. You're in the game. Play on. We're all in this together. Life's a team sport. But one of the things that I feel when I'm with you is I don't feel just my life. I feel your life emanating from you. And all together, there's so much love in here. I could never find a word to characterize it. Because there is beyond measure the gifts of our collective selves here, present now, that is a great gift to me and uplifting me. But... There is, is a mystery we live in that is greater than we can ever know. None of us will live long enough to explore all the excellences we're capable in our lives. So what you choose to do is extremely important, even if you choose to just lay down, veg out, watch television, and have the Pringles. Great. My oncologist told me when I asked her about certain things, could I have this or could I have that, she gave me a big smile. It was, it was genuine, but I recognized what she meant. She said, you can have whatever makes you comfortable. And I thought, on the positive side, that's great. I can have whatever makes you comfortable. On the downside is, ooh, it's not going to make any difference what I have. <laughs> so being comfortable is a very temporary thing. So my happiness is not dependent on my comfort level. It's dependent on my feeling my own aliveness and knowing that you feel that too. But that I've been gifted with having my sense of that aliveness, my awareness of it, ratcheted up to a point of white-hot intensity so I never am without that sensation. And in doing so, that makes me happy and heals me because I'm completely integrated. Not sitting up here as Greg Malzecki's body, not sitting up here with all my naked emotions, although I'm caught. I'm from a family that only laughs. But Kurt Vonnegut said, laughing and crying are the two things humans do when they can't do anything else. I'm not sitting here as an intellect or a scholar or a sage or a warrior. I'm not sitting here as a guru or a Tony Robbins a wannabe. No, I'm not a life coach in any way. Everything I've ever done with anybody has been an interaction between us on whatever terms you decided to offer me. And I was open to you as you presented yourselves because I love you. You know, we're in this together. I 
would you want to live my life without any of this? I don't know. It's not an answer. No, it was, it was great. It was great. Um, my question is the, 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 the urgency of, of your consciousness and your presence right now is how do you, how do we get a sense to be able to live life as the, a huge thing that I've learned from you, there's, there are many. One is, is the one you just said. If you can take who you are and ratchet up the intensity to a white hot level, there is beauty and magic in that. There's, there's great life in that. And that is what life is about. There is a breath you took that let me know that you had something to say. There's so much to share. But I wanted to say that decide that you're going to live a life without fear. You know, fear is like a, a very deep sort of pain. It goes to the center of your life and everything else is tangential to it. And I will tell you this, worry is a cancer of the emotions. You know, if worry erodes your time, it devours your energy, it consumes your intention, it destroys your plans, it wastes your ability to accomplish what you set out to do. We don't live in a world where time management is necessary. We live in a world where energy management is necessary. So counsel your energy by deciding that you're going to be brave in all circumstances and open your eyes to whatever happens and refuse to worry. Absolutely. If you have time to worry, you have time to work. You can work at changing a broken world. So I guess that's all I'm going to say because I'm going to say thank you to the people who presented and I hope you'll stay with me for that. And then we'll have a meet and greet. I know I wanted to have it over interactive and have a lot of questions about it, but obviously I used up all the time. So this is my graduation. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Woo! Okay. Okay. Great. I was inspired, speaking of First Nations, and this is a different kind of acknowledgement, that I was inspired by wisdom of one of the great leaders who fought alongside General Brock in the War of 1812, Mr. Tecumseh. And this is what he taught his people, and I'm going to recite it to you because it's what I found great comfort in and helped me orient myself towards how I was going to leave this life, which, believe me, I'm reluctant to do. So live your life so the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others and their views, and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and of service to your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or sign of salute when meeting or passing a stranger in a lonely place. Show respect to all people, a grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the light, for your life and strength. Give thanks for your food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies in yourself. Touch not the poisonous fire water that makes wise ones turn to fools and robs them of their visions. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and be like a hero going home. And that's what I want to show you. As I said to my kids, to my wife, I'm going to die like a hero going home because I've been blessed and gifted with you in my life and I have nothing more to ask of it, not even time. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making the effort. And thank you for your kindness and your love, your care. 
and your futures. Because I'm the past and you're the future. You're going to go into a world I cannot imagine. But I'm sure it's going to be a better world. And you're going to feel a lot happier when you know you can get angry when you, it's worth it. Okay? Be well. Thank you so much. I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here.